little house tricks. What's going on there in South Dakota? Basically was like any artist competition that doesn't have an age limit on it. I'm in. And so I entered Nancy Clue and it looks like it's a bunch of current DMA students that are advancing and not me. But that probably is what I should expect for the remaining three as well. So, Yeah, it's a funny thing. I mean, I remember, yeah, there are very few competitions without age limits. And it really is a nice opportunity for newer faculty members well just faculty members in general you know um but your life is busy in such different ways after you leave school I mean you're very busy as a doctoral student but it's still all like your brain is completely focused on something that's going to feed your artistry right and then you get a teaching job and you're like oh yeah I can I could do these competitions you know and then you you maybe think oh I guess I'm you know not as good as these younger people coming up, but you're also going to committee meetings and, you know, spending, spending half an hour at a time teaching your student how to use the fucking Google calendar on their phone. And I mean, this is the (laughs) shit I've been doing this semester. Literally. I have, I feel so out of shape at the end of a semester. Well, at the end of this semester, particularly this fall semester. Um, I mean, we're recording this at the end of the first semester won't come out, I guess, until probably January or, or February, but, um, And it's all non-music stuff that is eating up my time and energy, right? Which I think is everybody. It seems so universal when you get a job, but I don't know. Maybe people were trying to warn me in grad school and I wasn't listening. I'm I'm sure I was missing some subtle cues in grad school, but the things that no one told me about were how much time I would spend in my brain thinking about my car. And whether or not my car is going to break down and when I'm going to go switch out my tires, you know, to the winter tires and how I'm going to schedule that into my day, et cetera. Um, how, how can I make myself look less tired and what accessories and pieces of wardrobe should I have in my car or in my office at all times to, to fake it because I just barely managed to get my ass to the place I was supposed to be at on time um and then like how do you be in a meeting seriously just how how do you even these meetings are never they're never about anything you uh, they're never about anything I a either have a strong opinion about or b have what my colleagues would consider a valid opinion about do you experience that I feel like there's a script you know, and all the all the older faculty members are like, of course, this is the right answer. And I've just given up saying like, oh, what about this creative solution? Because, of course, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to do the thing that the school has done for 50 years kind of a thing. I am struggling to finish the sentence because I'm on a new campus. <laughs> and so I'm I'm still getting the lay of the land here. Sure. And I, I, I do feel each campus and each meeting has its sort of own culture and so you do have to sort of speak the language of of the people you're with i've participated in in large committee meetings at three universities two of which i was i guess considered a voting faculty member and one i was an adjunct that just wanted to know how things worked so i showed up and nobody stopped me from listening <laughs> um I don't know if I have a strong opinion about how those work. I don't enjoy meetings because it does seem like it takes a long amount of time for us to arrive at a solution that could have been two emails, but um, maybe I'm just an impatient personality. I definitely am too. Yeah. Yeah. I see, I see all the mugs and t-shirts, you know, showing up in my, my Instagram ads that say this could have been this meeting could have been an email but then at the same time nobody reads emails either so maybe it's more efficient to cut out the delayed reaction but sort of circling back to your your thoughts on practice um I think I definitely had a similar experience when I was commuting back and forth to a campus that it was just a lot of work to be a human but it's I guess doubly interesting both of the faculty positions that I've had have been a mix of flute and other stuff. And so 
similar to you, a lot of time, you know, just trying to be a functional adult, a lot of time in meetings or responding to emails. But then, you know, I've been at work for moving on seven hours today, and I'd say four and a half of them were spent contemplating Neapolitan chords and trying to find a score for students to analyze Neapolitan chords that didn't also include harmonies or or confusing things that they weren't ready for. So spending a lot of time doing music things and being a musician, but not being a flutist. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely the way jobs are have been going for a while. I mean, it's <laughs> there are still the flute only jobs, but, you know. Yeah, I don't know that 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 will ever be my life. It definitely does not seem the direction my adult life is headed. So I was I was chatting with a a colleague um, who's in a a similar boat. They have a pretty strong background in, in performance. And we were sort of bemoaning how on paper you have more time than you did in grad school. So in theory, you should be this amazingly in shape musician. But, you know. You spend four hours reading through scores and and analyzing chords to make sure that the kids can handle the Neapolitan that's here and there's nothing else that's going to wreck them and then you're brain dead. And it's like, and now I need to go problem solve and troubleshoot at at a high level in my flute playing and I've left it all on the page with the analysis example. So sometimes it's not so much a time as just a mental energy has been expended on something that maybe takes more mental energy because it's not my primary area of study so yeah that's a good point yeah of course we did that with our homework when we were students too but (laughs) I think the stakes well the stakes are higher when you're the teacher right I mean if you have if you have a conscience (laughs) you know then you really want to get it right well I mean the stakes are higher and it, it takes me more mental energy I think to prepare to be a theory teacher than it does to prepare to be a flutist I can sort of roll up and you know hear someone play flute for a few minutes and I'm like oh yeah I've got like 12 things that are going to help you but if if I want my theory students to walk away with any modicum of of information. I not only need to be on top of, you know, the subject matter, I need to think like, what are the ways that they're going to confuse themselves? What problems can I anticipate so that when they say, you know, why is this this way and not this way that I have an answer and I'm not standing in front of them going, er, um, and I find that less intuitive than figuring out how to make an E flat less sharp. Right. Yeah. I, and I wish I'd had you as a theory teacher. <laughs> I feel like you hold yourself to a higher standard than my a lot of my theory teachers did. But well, I think students are lucky. My one strength, if I have one, is that I was a terrible theory student. Uh, I was the one that was always confused and hopelessly lost, and so I think I more vividly than my theory teachers did at least remember having no idea what was going on in a class, and mm. so I. Like this confused me, this confused me, this confused me. I can at least fix the Elizabeth Robinson Jr. in the class. Um, I don't know if that helps. I look out and still see a sea of horrified faces, but I mean well, and that's all you can do. (laughs) I don't know. I've been thinking about, yeah, I think I'm just in that nostalgic holiday mood, you know, where you think about the past or whatever. I don't know. Um, but I was thinking about school, you know, a lot this weekend and this morning. And I was thinking about myself as a student and um, how I, I don't know, I guess how seriously I took things. There were some things I took I mean, I don't, I don't believe in regrets, you know, like just mulling over regrets and wallowing in them because all it does is make you feel bad. I mean, let, learn a lesson and move on if you can, you know, but um, so I, I won't, I, there's no point in saying I regret it, I guess. But if I, if I had it to do over again, I would back up and take some aspects of my life less seriously. Um, but then, you know, there were times when I always felt like I was not as serious as the people around me. Like, you know, for instance, in what I listened to, it seemed like, what did you listen to for fun as a student? Oh, I'm a terrible example. Well, so little Elizabeth Robinson bio time. I was coming to classical music studies um, from a place where I felt behind all of my colleagues 
And so, you know, we're sitting in theory and they've all had a basic amount of theory and I didn't know what a triad was. So I'm still like, what's a minor third? I don't know. And so I think I decided that everyone around me knew all of the major symphonies and knew all of the flute literature. And I had somehow grown up on an alien planet where those things didn't exist. So I didn't really listen to music so much for fun. I gave myself listening assignments and was like, well, this semester I'm going to learn all of the box sonatas. And that would be like all I listened to. Um, or we took wow. we took symphonic literature and uh, were expected to do the like drop the needles exams with you know Beethoven symphonies or Tchaikovsky symphonies or or whatever and so that would be like all I listened to and I didn't do as much listening to music for fun because I was determined that by the time I graduated I would be one of those people like my faculty members who could you know you play them 15 notes and they're like that's the second movement of Brahms's second symphony and the tempo is a little slower there than it normally is um so that's what I did for fun was not fun things homework self-imposed homework yeah oh, that's good that's uh that's I mean that's a great that's a very inspiring story for anyone who feels like a fish out of water that feels behind it landed me this amazing job where I spent half of my day worrying about Neapolitan chords yeah yeah I guess no good deed now you now you get to be the expert on these things yeah yeah I always I, I was not that way I mean like I I feel like I I was kind of maybe in the middle of the pack in terms of exposure. Like I, right. it, it wasn't, it wasn't a completely alien concept hearing classical music. And I was fortunate enough to grow up in a city where, you know, there was a great orchestra and we could go for very cheap or for free to watch rehearsals yeah. sometimes, but I never took it seriously. And even as I took my flute playing really seriously, it was not fun to me to listen to classical music. Oh, sure. Sure. You know, because it always felt, well, it was two things. It either felt like homework, which it was a lot yeah. of times, or um, I would get this. And it's such a, it's so mental, but I would get this feeling. I still struggle with it sometimes with wanting to listen to somebody's album that's just come out or something, you know, but I would listen to classical music, you know, trying to make myself do it for fun. And then I would just feel guilty that I wasn't practicing or that wasn't me who had accomplished that thing yet. Like even as an undergrad, sure. which is sure. super mental, I think I would think like, oh, I'm listening to these people who are so much better and more accomplished than me. And I don't know if I'll ever be there. And so there was like this melancholy, like I couldn't, I'm making it sound more severe than it was. There were certainly times when I would listen to Ravel for fun or something, cause it is gorgeous, but you know, I couldn't, I don't think I consumed as much classical or art music um, recordings as most of my classmates. And, and then I would feel bad about that, you know, because everybody else was like geeking out over the latest, you know, release of X opera or something. And, and yet at the same time, I just didn't feel like doing it. So I was listening to a lot of, you know, I was an undergrad in the mid to late nineties. So I was listening to a lot of Brit pop and, like a riot girl punk and and I felt like <laughs> nobody I mean my roommates were not musicians and so that was super easy you know for all of us to consume together but that was the stuff I always have I always have music playing around me but even now I often it's not classical and I felt I think I felt a lot of I didn't know this term imposter syndrome back then but I think I felt a lot of imposter syndrome um, as an undergrad, but some of it was of my own making because I wasn't, I wasn't like completely entrenching myself in the culture. I, I was just need to though. Yeah. Do you? I don't know. Like yeah. I, I've, we had obviously different backgrounds, but as you're talking, I'm not hearing anything that I didn't also experience, you know, with some variations for, yeah, for my background. Oh, I was going to say something smart in there. I don't know. Imposter syndrome. It's real. Yeah, probably, probably closer to universal than I will ever know, but but this was one way in which I was like, oh, maybe I don't want it enough. I'm not serious enough because I go, I go back to my apartment and I, you know, I'm listening to Fiona Apple or whatever for fun instead. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, I know that I, I, I can feel different parts of my brain, like lighting up and like creative ideas, not even related to music occurring to me when I listen to more complex music. And I really love that. 
Uh, but then I also, I think it's just a habit. I still want to eat the Doritos, early speaking. Like it's the, the fun, like pop music is just, it's like junk food. That's so easy to, to put on and listen to while I'm working in the kitchen or something. Is it junk food or just a different kind of food? I think it's junk food. I think it's junk food, which, and I'm going to keep eating the junk food, I guess, but I mean, it's short, it's short and it's less stimulating. I don't. It's short. I don't know if it's less stimulating. I don't know. I, there's, during there's... my like self-imposed, I only listen to like homework music phase. I remember very proudly telling my boyfriend at the time that this is I'm only going to listen to the music that's going to build me into the musician I want to be. And probably the smartest thing he ever said to me was what he said next, which was, you know, I would think as a aspiring professional musician, you would want to consume as much variety of music as you could and he just looked at me like he felt sorry for me um <laughs> was he a music major no no oh. he was he was uh, a, a music minor um that I had met in whatever ensemble I was in and majoring in something completely not music and not long to continue being in my life but probably the like smartest thing he said during our our time together was you, know, you should consume as many types of music as possible um and once i went off my self imposed diet of of only homework music i i think there was some merit in that i mean maybe it's the difference between like complex starches and you know simple starches you you still need them to eat it's just you can't have like all processed whatever all the time so sometimes it needs to just be something you like pop it in there you digest it yeah I listen to music even if it was <laughs> just Fiona Apple or whatever yeah yeah I mean being I, I suppose being a musical omnivore makes the most sense so I wonder because this was my 18 or 19 year old brain was like everybody else is listening to the right kind of music and they're being so good oh I don't even know if that was true, but it seemed like to some extent I was witnessing that. And yet I was just like, I can't do it. I don't want to, I don't want to listen to Beethoven symphony on a Friday night. You know, um, I don't see that in, yeah. So I wonder, I wonder how many other people experience that. I don't see that in my students. They, they seem completely unapologetic about whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Any breathy trash they're listening to. I don't remember a lot of friends talking about a lot of albums, but I also probably didn't create situations where they were sharing that they were so excited about the latest opera or whatever but you know going by conversations I have with students in my classes now and their knowledge of the canon of classical music is probably on par with what mine was when I was their age so you know maybe we're all perpetuating this vicious cycle of imposter syndrome ourselves yeah, it could be, could be. And uh, the posturing, you know, I, I mean, I can, I can, I can vividly remember going to people's apartments or people's dorm rooms when we were, when we were that young and who knows how staged it was, you know, they'd be halfway through a Shostakovich symphony, like, oh, but five is nice, but everyone does that. Do you know this part in 13? You know, and I was just like, oh God, am I supposed to know this too? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Huh. My roommate know. just got the Oasis CD. It's really good, you know. But but I think about the music that I like now, you know, the the like the contemporary classical. That sounds like contemporary Christian or something, doesn't it? The it art does. music. It, well, there's no there's no uh, satisfying name for this, is there? Because art music sounds snobby. But anyway, you know, the modern music I like to listen to, and I think it definitely has. Um, I love electronics. Uh, a lot of times it's got, it's got plenty of pop influences sprinkled in there. So maybe, uh, maybe, and some of these composers are younger than me, but some of them are my age or older. So maybe people were more closet Brit pop listeners than I realized. I hope so. I to admit, I do remember interviewing Carter Pan when we were doing those video interviews for FNMC, like before before he had started Giantess, the commission that he did for us. Um, and he was talking about, I had asked him what what influences he had in mind going into it. And he was like, oh, Copeland, the Copeland duo and the Prokofiev Sonata. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. He knows these, these big pieces in our literature. But then he was like, but also I like Journey and I like Steely Dan. And I was like, <laughs> 
I would love to do a retrospective with Carter to find out which one of those influences actually ended up in Giantess. I think yeah. I could see Prokofiev. I'm having a harder time imagining Steely Dan, but maybe I'm not thinking of the right Steely Dan. Exit. Right. Yeah. And I might be, I might be saying the wrong thing. It was some seventies stuff. Maybe it wasn't Steely Dan. Yeah. And I had told uh, the only way I could get my colleague to agree to play this piece, the sight unseen, you know, score unseen with me was to share with her like other pieces he'd written and tell her about the influences that he cited I didn't mention the 70s rock because I don't think she listened to that growing up in Taiwan but I mentioned Prokofiev and and Copeland and she was like oh okay I know those well you know so she said yes because that made her comfortable and then she also said oh we should also I tend to do this because I always feel like I have to beg a pianist like I feel so apologetic asking a pianist to play with me and so I always you know throw him a bone and say like all right let me pick these pieces and then you can pick the second half of the recital or whatever like you can pick a big piece or something and so I was like all right so if you play this Carter Pan and something else I think I wanted to do I, I can't remember something something else with piano that was short then you can pick you can pick a, a piece that you know or want to do and so she was like let's do Prokofiev <laughs> and so the <laughs> recital was like Definitely the most high D's I've ever played, which was fine. Um, but yeah, it was really, it, it was really a, a big push energy wise. And I remember, you know, so I was working on those two pieces back to back and I don't remember f feeling very Prokofi of like in Carter's piece. I don't, I know, I don't know if Chichen was satisfied if she ever decided that Prokofiev was in there, but I was doing those two pieces for the same recital. And I was like, this is just like wearing two different, very uh, heavy hats. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't have the Carter in front of me and it's been a few years there? since I played it, but yeah. there isn't there a little passage somewhere in there where he's like waffling between d's and various registers that kind of reminds me of of that little lick in the fourth movement where you have to do all of that yeah, like be. slurring between the registers and there were some moments i don't know exactly what was happening in the piano score but i there were some moments where i can visualize the pianist that i was working with having to do these like giant hand over hand heavy chord leaping motion things that felt very Prokofiev or they feel very in my memory very yeah. Prokofiev oriented so I don't know I think inspiration can be such a loose term that maybe he looked at Prokofiev and was like yeah loud chords and high d's and that was <laughs> that be. was it could it could be that simple of an inspiration or it could be you know one of those little minutiae that only the composer would be deeply aware of and we as the flutist are just like so much energy yeah, that would be interesting to to ask and just go back and listen. Because now that I'm talking about it, I haven't listened for a while either. That might be well, a I, I don't know. I composers get inspired in so many different ways in so many different styles. I'm I'm thinking of like uh, Nicole Chamberlain's Death Whistle, which I had probably played an embarrassing number of times before she started telling stories about which orchestral excerpts that it had been loosely inspired by um mm. she had been monitoring my social media feeds when she was writing it and i had been <laughs> venting a little bit about some of the orchestral parts i was learning right and so literally there are quotes from pieces that i had literally played and posted to facebook complaining about that are, are worked into this piece <laughs> and it took her going doink this passage is that in it a much more literal inspiration that I didn't catch until I was hit over the head with it so sometimes inspiration is small and loose but other times inspiration is like these are the same intervals you big dummy <laughs> that would be such an interesting tutorial to just have you like talk us through it Oh, I i mean, you don't really need a tutorial. If you listen to any of her interviews about the piece, she'll go oh. through and, and oh. name them. I, she was cryptic about one, but I talked to her later and she knew exactly what symphony she'd cribbed it from. So it's there. You just have to be more observant than I am. I don't know it's if I should give it a to personal you. touch. It's definitely the more I learn about it, you know. I think we're working on 
10 years after the fact, the more I'm like, wow, that is deeply personalized. I feel weird about that. <laughs> really? Oh, it just makes you more conscious of the things you absentmindedly say to friends and or on Facebook. Like, <laughs> maybe, maybe I should keep some of my musical opinions to myself, I say to another friend as we record a podcast. Yeah, I... I mean, I think the piece turned out really well. That's really cool that, you know, she knew you well enough and was paying enough attention that she she chose to put that energy into it and could. I mean, that's yeah. pretty special. It's I mean, it's super cool. And you you read about like letters going back and forth between the Schumanns and, and Brahms. And I don't know if, you know, Death Whistle will be the... <laughs> It'll be <laughs> in the next piano concerto of... of- 200 years from now but like that's how it happens so say it's elizabeth on facebook well i i I hesitate to um say that you know musicology students in the year 2432 are going to be learning what facebook was so they can find out why this obscure howard hansen symphony was quoted in this piccolo piece but nice i got nothing to say about howard hansen I only remember we played one symphony. There was an extended up an octave passage on piccolo. I played it. The conductor cut off the entire orchestra. No. Looked down at the score, looked up at me, and he had a very thick Japanese accent, said, Is that right? <laughs> and I said, It says APA in my part. Do you want me do you want me to take it down? No, I guess we should do it. But why? And then we did it again. So did you never take it down? Oh, no, he wanted it written. as written. Huh? If the composer wrote it, we should do it. But his his attitude was kind of like mine. But why? Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting question, you know. Like, I don't know. I feel like some composers can be trusted more than others. But... <laughs> That's going to get some comments, but you know, and and like, well, I mean, going back to Nicole, because we, we all were on a panel together once with her at NFA and she was talking about like, do what I wrote for you. And I, I have no qualms about that because what she writes is very intelligent and well-informed. Also I'm a flutist, she's a flutist. So she's never going to write anything in a flute part that I'm ever going to have question about because she's a very good flutist too. But you, you think about that with a lot even with like dynamics and things you know when I when I go over the standard orchestral excerpts with my students and I'm teaching them just you know basically the way my orchestral performer teachers taught them to me um sometimes you don't do the dynamics that are written for instance you know it's written pp but it's a solo well that's obviously you can't you can't play PP. That's insane, you know? And, and my students will say like, well, how was I supposed to know that? I mean, not in a defensive way, but you know, just like, how, how do you know these things? Like, how do you know what to change when you feel like you're supposed to be following the directions on the page? And my answer is always kind of like, I don't know. I mean, some, some composers just didn't write the right stuff. (laughs) I mean, to some extent, you know, I think that's, that's how the musical can gets handed down is like all right this is what Brahms wrote but this is obviously bullshit you need to be forte you know that kind of thing like you just some of these things just come from teachers who have those experiences and who have been taught that by their conductors and it gets handed down in this way it's not a satisfying answer though you know um and like Howard Hansen if Howard Hansen were there in that rehearsal would he have said yeah that does seem a little high I don't think it's necessary you know plus What did a piccolo sound like when he wrote it versus what piccolos can do now in terms of playing out and resonating? So it's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I always want to do right by a composer to the best of my ability because it's, I feel like that's the best I can do for them is try to respect what they've put on the page for me, you know, and try to, to represent the directions they've given me to the audience. But then sometimes when stuff doesn't work, I feel like, well, could I fix this a little bit for you? <laughs> Would it be, is this really what you meant? And this is the great thing about working with living composers is that you can just ask them. But the I, uh, dead ones are tricky. Living composers, definitely, definitely speaking to them, I guess with the no longer with us composers. I don't know. I, I'm, 
it's interesting to talk about this with another performer in a semester where I find myself teaching an orchestration class for mm. the first time because like many you know first class preps I am reading every single orchestration manual I can get my mitts on whether it's you know the one from 1880 whatever that Rimsky Korsakov put together or you know the like fourth edition of the Samuel Adler that what came out earlier this year and kind of comparing notes between the two and like I obviously don't play all of the instruments that are discussed in these orchestration manuals but looking at orchestration guides for instruments I'm more familiar with like not all of the information is 100% accurate 100% of the time so are composers writing because that's what the orchestration manual said was good or are they how much information is coming from live performers and how much information is coming from orchestration manuals and like yeah I context yeah. context is important um you know if it's if it's for piccolo and, and Nicole wrote it I'm probably going to do what's on the page because I don't want to yeah. get a nasty phone call later, but uh... <laughs> and she knows what she's doing. So, I mean, like she's earned that. She's earned that right to say, like, just do what I told you to do because just do what I told you to do. She's a, she, had the, she has a funny story about that. And me too, though, where she was telling me to do something. And I was like, my dude, it's not it's not working. Um, and she's doing it on her piccolo and it's working and I'm doing it on my piccolo and it's not working. And she's given me a piccolo lesson over text message. And then it turns out that one of us needed to get our instrument to the repair shop and then it worked fine wow, wow. <laughs> amazing so even then I don't know yeah. it's just another another mm. always talk to your composer performer if that person is alive if you can um and then if that person is not alive like yeah I guess I never really thought about the piccolo being that different when Howard Hansen was writing for it maybe it was uh, I mean, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, you see that though. You see, I mean, I've certainly come across more than one piccolo part in my lifetime and thought, I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's a terrible fucking idea. I mean, when it comes to piccolo, I usually do what the paper says to do, which was, I guess, part of the reason Nicole was writing in the stratosphere is I do it and then immediate neighbors in the orchestra are not always happy with me oh well yeah you uh you're able also i'm a oh shit i have a gig so i better get back in shape on piccolo i like playing piccolo but i don't make the time to do it until something comes up it's cute that you think i do stay in shape or like the piccolo <laughs> yes <laughs> No, I, I like doing it, but no, I don't, I don't have as, as big of a maintenance routine as people often give me credit for. I have a gig in two weeks, so I'll probably get it out again here in a day or two. I hate how long it takes me to remember where to put it on my face. It's oh, really? It's so stupid. Oh. Yeah. Like, I don't know, probably a week of, you know, just... Really? Maybe 15 minutes of doing some tone exercises. Like do a little uh, Mazzanti, the Mazzanti method. Yeah, yeah. Do you have that look? I like that. I like that uh, book. But yeah, it just, every day feels a little different until I have a sense memory again of like, oh yeah, this is where it goes. Do you think this is a thing where you have like such a careful and detailed flute maintenance routine that your muscle memory is just way stronger than mine? And I'm like, I don't know, goes in like this general vicinity somewhere. Listen uh, to us giving each other more credit than we think we deserve. No, I, I mean, think so. I think I, I'm, just, I'm not a great pickle player. I think I'm just I like, have heard you talk right. about your warm up routine, and I aspire to be as regular and structured as you are. I know that that is not always the case in my own practice routine so do you feel like do you feel like on flute there are times when you don't know where to put it though I feel like the plate does a lot of the work for you oh um I mean I, I find I don't work I don't actively think about it yeah I don't I don't think about it on flute either but Maybe I also, it's really like, time on it, but crack a lot more than you do so I'm I'm asking if if your like obsessive need to know where it goes gives you more stability on flute but then causes you to have 
question marks about the piccolo and I have less stability on flute so I don't care as much (laughs) (laughs) I don't know I think uh I think having that lip play just really does a lot of the thinking for you yeah I mean that might also be true I also don't do as much thinking as maybe I ought to about many things so well it's a it's a double-edged sword isn't it though Medium bowl porridge is what I often say. I like, I don't realize how much I say stuff sometimes until my students start saying it back to me or like saying it in studio class and going, ha ha, you know, like nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But medium bowl of porridge has been coming up a lot in studio class the last it's the first time I've heard years. it from you, but I like it. I say it a lot in lessons though, you know, cause like you ask them to make a correction and then God bless them. You know, they, they really go ape shit trying to do it. And then it's yeah. like way too far in the other direction. It's like, dude, it was like a fraction of a millimeter. We need to change that. Let's oh, chill. So medium bowl of porridge. I did a yoga teacher training many lifetimes ago. Mm. And yeah. the person that ran it was very into precise language. And she was a big fan of, of instructions, having an end point. Mm. And I feel teaching yoga, the little bit that I did, uh, has a lot of similarities with teaching flute in that you give them an instruction and often as you just observed, it goes way too far in the other direction. So it's like, there's, there's an end point to this instruction, continue moving your flute in this direction until Mm, it stops helping. I don't know. So I don't. I don't medium bowl of porridge, but I do often ask my students if there's like an end point to that instruction. Well, that's good. Smart. Yeah. And it all, it all comes down to what it sounds like. I mean, any, any adjustment we're trying to make, it's just to make the sound better. Yeah. But sometimes you, I don't know. I try not to do this as a teacher. I hope I don't do this as a teacher, but um, I do find my students come in my undergrads anyway, come in, even sometimes my master's students, and they're not very aware physically of what they're doing on the flute. Oh, yeah, like they're yeah. not very aware of how the flute works acoustically. And so they're just kind of like throwing, throwing everything at the wall to see what it sticks sort of a thing. And so I do feel like a lot of my early instruction with new students tends to be a lot of physical awareness, you know, just yeah. so that because they have to go away and make decisions for themselves all week, mm-hmm. you know, so how do you do that when I'm not here to, I can't go, go up to them like they're 10 year olds and move the flute on their faces until they get a sound, you know? Um, but then over time, sometimes it seems like they're more a- aware of the physical sensations. Like they're very aware of the physical sensations that they want to copy and what they did. But if I stop and say like, okay, but what did it sound like just now? They're like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, was it bad? I don't know. Yeah. Or they're like, oh yeah, I, you know, I, I, I really, um, I learned this from a, a friend who studied with Jeff Nelson on horn at IU. He does the fearless performance. I like following him on Instagram, although it's a little bit too kumbaya for me sometimes, but um, it's good to, good to read, but he does this thing very regularly in lessons or did with her where, you know, he would, he would let her play through a whole thing, whatever movement, passage something and then he would say okay tell me three things you liked and three things Mm -hmm. you didn't like about Mm -hmm. about that performance and then the rest of the lesson was basically workshopping that and I I've been doing that I mean since since she told me about it years ago I have used that a lot in lessons yeah with certain students you know there are students who you know you you come to to find have a really long list of things they liked that you don't agree with <laughs> like really <You're> like <laughs> that was that was enough okay uh and then the yeah so those students I stopped doing that with but but the students who the majority of my students really benefit from it and struggle yeah. to come up with things that they liked um but the things that they do like uh, sometimes they'll reflect not what it sounded like at all like oh I really liked yeah. that I remember to keep my throat open cool. That is, that is important. And I've been pounding that into your brain for two years. So I'm glad that you're thinking about it, but how was the pitch? (laughs) And they're like, (laughs) no idea. You know? Well, I mean, it kind of goes into teaching them how to feel when they play the instrument, but I guess also how to hear. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so ties back into like what are you listening to what are what food are you feeding these ears that you're using yeah Um, whether it's like what are you listening to in an overall 
musical experience or what are you listening to right in that moment when you just played me that thing? Uh, apparently it wasn't intonation or, you know, insert other musical idea. Well, I think this language about an endpoint could really help incorporate, you know, as you're as you're making physical adjustments with a student, like the endpoint is it, it can. Uh, how do you assess when you've gotten past the point of productivity? Well, your ears are going to be what tell you. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I'm doing like. As you're talking, I'm thinking, OK, so I'm using feel to play the flute, but my body is an evolving living organism. Like, what do you do with your students to address the changing feeling because they had too much salt one day or like they get older and stuff <laughs> sits different? I, I have a different facial shape than I had when I was in undergrad because I enjoy french fries like does that it feels <laughs> different to hold or play the flute does that factor into your right feeling yeah it makes me want to go into uh the age thing because that that's very that's very interesting to me right now so are you are you noticing I guess I I'm I'm having a lot of conversations with friends, musicians and not musicians about just um becoming middle aged and how oh. weird how how weird it is to be aware of parts of your body that you could just take for granted before. Sure. And I don't have those conversations with with musicians very much, but I've definitely, I mean, you know, I I ended up with a frozen shoulder during the pandemic that was excruciating. Sure. And um, two years on, I think I'm finally, I'm, I don't know what it looked like before because I never paid attention when my shoulder just worked, but it's not totally symmetrical with the way my other one moves, but I think I'm back to full mobility now, but two years it took me. Yeah. And during that time, you know, trying to figure out how to keep playing and, and wondering if it was ever going to go back to normal enough that I could play as much as I used to. Um, and hating that I felt like I had to keep it to myself and not talk about it. You know, like that old, yeah. like, oh, we don't talk about our injuries as musicians because then you look weak and soft and no one will hire you and you, you sound washed up. But, and I, and I think that that is so damaging and so old school, but I also was shy about talking to people about it or when I would bring it up to other flute players. Cause I was curious if it was a flute thing or if it was just a me thing or genetics or something. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have such close relationships with so many flutists and yet we don't talk about our bodies in that way. Oh, I don't know. I, I have spent a little bit of time recently with singers and their body is their instrument. So there's a lot more right. body talk flying around in a new job getting to know new populations of of flutists and people who teach young flutists like you're going into a middle school or a high school and you're working with a lot of students that have a lot of really good setup but you know maybe they're holding the flute a little weird or they're like the way that they're orienting themselves around the instrument is a little bit strange and i i find myself saying to them like you've probably grown Anyway, I find myself saying to students often, um, you know, you've probably grown since you received, you know, whatever the instruction was. Do you think your body has changed since you developed this particular approach to the instrument? And I'm still early enough middle age that like I'm bigger than I was when I was a flute student, but I don't know that I've noticed a lot of change in functionality but I find myself saying that phrase like you've you've probably grown you've probably changed mm -hmm. so often that it's it's in the forefront of my mind like my body is changing I am a an arguably middle-aged woman which is really different than the you know like 18 year old whippersnapper <laughs> who burst into a music degree many years ago um like I'm sure things are working differently and I'm sure they're going to continue to be more different as time marches forward like I don't I don't know I'm just I'm trying to be aware that stuff can change even like outside of a, a major mm. injury 
So you don't, I mean, do, do you feel like you, you were using the example of your face? Oh, I mean, I don't know. Like you, you talk a lot about placing the flute in a specific place and you use very specific language about like knowing where to blow the air and have in other conversations emphasized, you know, precision of a warm up so that you feel like air is moving in exactly the right place. And I have mm. a much more haphazard approach approach to the instrument partially because I can't I don't function well with like really strict parameters otherwise it sets off the like type a anxiety brain and I found I just don't get as much done so like I don't force myself to think about it that way but also as a result like if something were shifting or changing I think I'd be late to the being aware of it party um so I guess I'm saying like, are you, do you feel like it's changed as your face changes since you're very aware of it from day to day? I wonder, um, you know, are my, I mean, like from day to day, it's impossible to say, but you know, if I were to go back and look at photos from my undergrad, I'd have to go dig out actual photos or something. I have wondered lately if my lips are getting thinner, you know, like I feel like um, I do maybe over the course of the last few what year maybe maybe over the course of the last almost year I have found that um I have to be more thoughtful about where I put my head joint sure uh like it's just not it's not just the simple like line it up and be done with it that it always was before uh I I mean I never know if that's just me becoming too hyper aware because I've spent so much more time just playing by myself right um when I was when I was making more chamber music when I had a trio you know I I had to get out of my own head and just focus on what I was hearing right from from the other two people in my trio and matching them and I think you know that allowed me to not wallow too much but yeah I feel like I feel like um in the morning well, this wouldn't necessarily make sense with thinner lips, but I just know that that happens as you age in the morning when I, if I practice, you know, like after breakfast, I feel like I have to roll out to get a decent sound. Huh. And then if I, if I just, you know, stick my flute on my flute stand, if it's a day that I'm at home and come back to it later in the day, then I'm like, holy shit, why is this so rolled out? You know, I can't, I can't. Get <laughs> it down. So then I've got to, I've got to roll it back in some to line up. See, I wonder if I have a similar experience because I'll often feel stuffier or closed in the morning and then I find I make a better sound, like an overall just tone in the afternoon. If I usually my instrument goes back in the case and gets put back together, but I often feel my ability to produce a sound that I'm proud of is higher in the afternoon, although my ability to focus in a way that I'm proud of is higher in the morning. So it's just like <laughs> tug of war between do I want the better tone, but I'm too brain dead to make good decisions about what I'm actually executing or do I want um maybe not as good of a tone because it's the morning and I'm sleepy or whatever but maybe our faces remember. are puffy or something in the morning maybe they stay maybe our maybe our lips stay puffy without it being noticeable but enough that it affects your flute playing well I mean I was talking to a singer who was talking about like skin thinning with age um yeah. and I, I was I was thinking more specifically of, of the lips because they do change mm -hmm. for women at least as they age but the singer was talking about like the texture of skin and the amount of collagen in your face changing. And it it started as a, you know, a beauty regime conversation, but her comment was, you know, she noticed that it changed the way that she resonated when she was using various different parts of her face as an extension wow. of, of resonators. Um, and so, you know, we don't, huh. I think I don't, I don't know what you do. We don't talk as, heavily detailed about like where in your sinus cavities your sound is resonating when you're making a, a truly singing flute tone but we do compare it to singing so I'm like mm -hmm. dimly aware that some of what I'm doing is probably comparable to what my singer friends are doing so if my singer friends are noticing you know with age xyz has changed about the way my face is structured is that then changing my tone on the flute I don't I don't know wow interesting yeah, I, I've never heard that, but yeah, that would I'm I would think it would affect us to a lesser extent. I do think that our our 
you know, our heads, all that space inside <laughs> yeah. and throat and chest. I mean, it's definitely helping to make the sound on the yeah. flute. So huh. I don't know. And then maybe mm-hmm. all of this is junk science and maybe my friend was, you know, feeding me a, a big old, a big old steam and plate of, of junk science. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and you, yeah, you can't separate your perception from what's, what's truly happening. I mean, you don't, you don't know how much of it is just your perception on a certain day. Sure. Sure. You might be doing the exact same thing for 50 years. But it just starts feeling different. <laughs> Maybe when I started talking, I should have specified, I feel like I'm finally in a place in my life where I'm consistently getting closer to the recommended amount of sleep and I'm spending more Mm -hmm. time in my home. So the sleep is in my bed, which makes a big difference for, for sleep quality. But I find in the mornings when I'm able to do the practice, um, I feel a lot more efficient and I think I am making better choices in the context of whatever I'm practicing now that I'm like eating vegetables and sleeping sometimes and have access to the the sort of stuff that makes you a a functional human. Um, And Maybe I did grad school the wrong way, but that was definitely not the experience of self care and self maintenance that I was having as a student. So, no, no, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know anybody who was. Well, I mean, like, I I want to allow that maybe I just did it wrong because that happens sometimes. But I I feel that when I am in a practice room or practice space, because also being an adult, I don't have to use practice rooms. I have an office. Right. But um, when I was nice. doing the the maintenance work that is practice, I feel if I've, like, I can tell a bigger difference if I've been able to take care of myself versus like, we're just white knuckling it through life. And that was <laughs> not available. I wonder if I would have gotten more out of grad school if I'd like had the space to be a person. I wonder how common it is that people have the space to be a person in grad school, though. I don't know of anyone who would own it, so I'm gonna yeah. say. <laughs> well, and then you know, then there was at least at, at least when I was in grad school, and when you were in grad school, probably you know there was this sort of um, martyrdom that we were all supposed to wear on our sleeves. So even if you did ha- have a chance to live a slightly more comfortable life, even for a week, you wouldn't want to admit it, you know. There was yeah. A, it was much more valiant to be, to be uh, suffering for brilliant. one's art. I wonder if that will change. I mean, even this term self care certainly didn't exist when when I was in school, and it wasn't something that anyone would have wanted to. I'm sure it existed, but it wasn't something getting thrown around all the time. Um, and it wasn't something that I think I or any of my classmates would have wanted to admit to. Because it would have sort of been like saying, oh, I'm, I'm not trying hard enough or something. Right. Which I'm not saying is good. It's not healthy the way I came up, but. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like cycling back to the beginning of our conversation, I have more space to take care of myself as a biological entity than I did in grad yeah. school. But I also have less intellectual bandwidth to take advantage of that newer more self-cared for version of myself so maybe it all balances out in the end and I'm just whining about stuff but yeah the little creature comforts that we didn't used to have though that is a nice reminder yeah because I was definitely whining about stuff at the beginning and uh yeah I don't miss practice rooms I don't miss practice rooms I like being in charge of my own schedule even when the schedule I make for myself isn't humane at least I made it I did that that was me (laughs) The ability to make one's own life uncomfortable is, or the choice, maybe it's the choice. Yeah. So yeah. Nicole, what are you listening to? Uh, well, Bikini Kill. And um, this is, for for me, this is kind of nostalgic too, but I've, I've gone back to listening to Naive and Sentimental Music by John Adams, which was, oh. when that was new, I was a doctoral student and my now husband and I were living together in sin. <clears throat> and it was, it was a, a CD. So we're playing the CD because we still have a CD player. It was a CD that he bought and we would just play a lot. It's great. If you, if you like John Adams, which I do. 
And um, I've actually gone back. And so we have a CD player. We have all these CDs. We have a CD player at home, right? We we can't can't play it in the car anymore. I've you know I'm not using a laptop that's got one. Like the CDs are definitely going out, right? I'm looking right, at right. all my flute CDs, and I'm like, which ones of these do I actually want to keep? And which ones do I want to give to students? Oh, whoops! I can't give any to students. They just stare blankly at me when I ask who has a CD player. So so you know I've been Marie Kondoing the shit out of my house lately because I just can't stand all the crap in it. And making some tough decisions about CDs, which means playing a lot of them that we hadn't played for years. Because even when we have something on CD, we're just live, we're, we're just streaming it a lot of times. And so when I used to write reviews for the Flutist Quarterly, I would get all these physical CDs in the mail to review. Mm -hmm. Towards the end, it was, you know, before I stopped doing it, it was, it was more just um, like, albums that I would download from an email but one of them one of the last physical CDs I got was called In the Loop by this duo Woodwired hmm. it's flute and bass clarinet I think she only plays bass clarinet um Hannah Leffler is the flute player in the group I don't I don't know if they're still doing stuff together because this was in the before times but it's all um flute and bass clarinet and electronics processed electronics some some fixed media and all the pieces are pieces that they've written mm -hmm. and it's really cool hmm. so that's my weird list of three right now okay i tried to listen to some bjork because bjork kept getting invoked in our in our first interviews yep and i can uh, she she's an interesting person i just feel like I don't know. I'm not smart enough or something. I like, I, I can listen to like two tracks and then I'm like, that's enough. That's enough Bjork for me. So I feel like there's, there's too much stimulus for me to make sense of or something in Bjork. So she's, she was on my list as homework, but. Meh. I feel like there's a homework joke I want to make here at the end. I don't know what it is. Insert witticism about homework listening now. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Music Crush. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also support the podcast, read show notes, and learn more about FNMC by visiting www.flutenewmusicconsortium.com. Support for this podcast comes in part from the Flute New Music Consortium. FNMC serves as a catalyst for collaborations between contemporary flutists and composers by commissioning new works, amplifying select recent works, organizing simultaneous premieres, and encouraging repeat performances of all FNMC-sponsored works. To learn more, visit www.flutenewmusicconsortium.com today.